Fawad Qureshi from the Mayo talk to us about uh, dialysis access today. And and uh, in fact, you know, sincere thanks for him uh, uh, accepting this invite at the at the last moment. I think I sent him an email uh, at Ayub's uh, uh, introduction about ten days ago. So this is uh, really wonderful that he could make it uh, at an early hour. I think it's seven o'clock and in Rochester, Minnesota. So Dr. Qureshi, he's a consultant in nephrology and hypertension at the Mayo Clinic in uh, Rochester, Minnesota. He did his medical training at Dow University in Karachi, Pakistan, and he did residency and fellowship at the University of Minnesota and Mayo Clinic. Uh, apart from nephrology, he's also an interventional nephrologist with the ASDIN, and he's the chair of quality improvement at uh, Mayo Clinic. Uh, today, he'll be talking to us about dialysis access needs in hospitalized patients, as well as how we can use that to enhance outpatient dialysis access. Uh, welcome, Dr. Qureshi. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hirmat, and thank you, Dr. Ayub, uh, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. Um, and it's amazing that I'm sitting in Rochester, Minnesota, and uh, was talking to my parents this morning. And I said, you know, I'll be giving a lecture, a grand rounds in Ottawa. And he said, but you were in Rochester just like yesterday. I'm like, yes, I'm going to stay there and and give this lecture. So, well, first of all, I'm, I'm very thankful for this technology, and I'm very thankful for you inviting me. I hope uh, this is going to be an interesting topic. Uh, I think we all of us uh, go through uh, patients who um, are in the hospital with acute kidney injury and uh, in and require an access. Uh, this talk um, um, is a clinical review of dialysis access. And uh, the learning objectives are to understand dialysis access and different type of uh, dialysis access and its complications and troubleshoot some of the dialysis access related uh, complications. Uh, the biggest disclosure that I have is that other than I do not have any financial disclosure, the, the most important disclosure is that I am not going to be discussing peritoneal dialysis, which is very important. Peritoneal dialysis is one of the best dialysis. We should consider PD in not only acute kidney injury, but as a first line of therapy. And, uh, and so, so with that thought, uh, once you have considered that and work towards making sure that your institute has peritoneal dialysis for acute kidney injury patients and uh, you have access to placement of those catheters and training of the patients and provide acute um, peritoneal dialysis. Um, with that disclosure, I think I'm going to move and mostly talk about uh, hemodialysis, IV access, uh, that is uh, uh, hemodialysis, not PD. This uh, is accredited with the Royal College of Physicians in Canada. I'm not sure how many um, uh, it's 1.0 or how many uh, units does it provide, but I'm sure uh, you can talk to Dr. Hyremeth and Dr. Yoop and find out. Um, I will start with a patient, 62-year-old um, gentleman with a history of chronic kidney disease of stage four, diabetes for 20 years, admitted with severe sepsis. Urine output is nothing. Um, patient was uh, volume resuscitated and this is important the new indicate the new amount of volume that needs to be given according to ICU and ER standards is 30 ml per kilogram not 6 liters or 10 liters that uh, we have been doing in the past which causes patients to get fluid overloaded and end up being uh, with pulmonary edema and end up requiring intubation at an early stage um, so 30 ml per kilogram is an, is the recommendation from the uh, ICU and ER perspective, which he got, and then he was started on pressors. He was mechanically ventilated because he had acute respiratory failure and was started on antibiotics. Um, these were his labs, and because of his labs, uh, bicarbonate being low, potassium being very high, they used appropriate fluids, which is D5W with 150 milli equivalents of uh, sodium bicarbonate, which is isotonic with 150 milliequivalents of sodium without any chloride in it. So they started that. Uh, this patient, uh, before um, he got admitted, his um, uh, BUN was only 40, and uh, his uh, creatinine was 2.8 with a potassium of 4.4. Bicarbonate was normal. Hemoglobin was normal. Uh, this is before admission. Uh, ultrasound of the kidney was done, which showed average size kidneys with increased echogenicity. And we'll talk about what is uh, what does that mean? Uh, yeah. So the question is, what would you do for this patient who 
has these labs started on on all of this and he has no urine output and now he's going into pulmonary edema. Um, so basically the decision was that we are going to dialyze him. And these are the options when we think about dialysis. We think about either putting a right IJ catheter or a left IJ catheter, right or left femoral catheter, right or left subclavian catheter. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each and why and why not. So starting with location and complication. And when you are thinking about dialysis catheters, one of the most important thing to remember is what is the roadmap of the dialysis catheter? Where is it going to travel? How it's going to travel? And, and making sure what is the length of that catheter and how long it's going to stay. And so if you think about right IJ catheters, usually the right IJ catheters and the femoral catheters are the straightest catheter. The right IJ catheter gets into the right IJ and drops down into the right atrium. Femoral catheters goes into the femoral vein and goes straight up into the inferior vena cava. The left IJ catheter, on the other hand, um, has to first make a right turn into the subclavian and then needs to take a left turn into the superior vena cava. So it kind of a turns twice, which can cause a complication in blood flow rates, etc. And then we have subclavian catheters, which we will talk about a little further and um, and uh, an understanding uh, that one of the complications is a catheter length. Um, it's either small or too long or where is the location? And again, how long did it last? And as I discussed, the roadmap. So, so the first thing is we are going to talk about uh, why IJ catheters are superior over subclavian accesses. Those of us who have practiced for many, many years, uh, we have seen uh, subclavian catheters, and uh, I'm sure uh, the young fellows must not have seen too much subclavian access and subclavian catheter for temporary or permanent access. And the reason for that is that once a subclavian catheter is placed, it causes subclavian and superior vena cava obstruction. This is one of the study um, uh, published in 1990 in which they took 52 patients, 32 with subclavian catheters and 20 with internal jugular catheters. And individuals who had the subclavian catheters, 90% of them had 70 to 100% occlusion of the subclavian vein. Um, six patients had bilateral severe uh, strictures. And uh, the long-term stricture rate for subclavian catheters in the subclavian ve vein was so high that uh, you know we stopped placing subclavian vein catheters unless or until the patient is either going to die or the patient does not have any access at all. Probably it is better than the trans uh, um, uh, catheters that we pl place in the back, but definitely not better than the femoral catheters. So um, as talking about uh, uh, the path the catheter has to take, this is a catheter which uh, A is a catheter which was placed in the left IJ. When you place a left IJ catheter, it goes down, then it goes into the subclavian, and then it turns around. And when you have this much turning around, you have a lot of resistance of blood flow. When you have a lot of resistance in blood flow, what you have is uh, more clotting, more uh, decreased blood flow, and therefore poor dialysis. And, and this is just one way of looking at it in, uh, in a two-dimensional picture. But if you look at it in a three-dimensional picture, it doesn't have only one and two turns, but it has multiple turns um, as you know, it is uh, turning not only from left to right, but from back to front also. The right IJ catheter, on the other hand, if you look at it, it, it just goes straight. It has only one turn, which is for turnal catheters, which so that they will come out of the chest. Um, just for the fellows um, or the residents, if they are here, if a catheter is coming out of a chest, that does not mean the catheter is a subclavian catheter. So this is an example. If the catheter is usually going on top of the uh, clavicle, then it is a 
it is usually on an IJ catheter, but if it is going below the clavicle, then it is a subclavian catheter. So in this case, it is above and and it is placed just uh, in the lower IJ. Temporary catheters are placed in the upper IJ and uh, permanent tunnel dialysis catheter are placed in the lower IJ. And so that's what it is. And then knowing what is the location of the uh, of the tip, the tip um, we always heard in the when I was getting to my training, we always talked about, oh, it needs to be at the junction of the superior vena cava and right atrium. But the correct answer to the tip for the location of the tip is it's in the right atrium because it has to suck. It has to draw 350 ml of blood and it cannot draw 350 ml of blood uh, from the supi uh, superior vena cava. It can do so in the right atrium. Moving on to uh, infection rates. Um, if we talk about infection rate, there was a great study in the Mayo Clinic proceeding in 2006, uh, which uh, did a systematic review of 200 published uh, uh, prospective studies, and it showed uh, basically for every one uh, one thousand uh, microbiologically proven um, catheter infection, um, this is the rate. The picks have 1.1 per 1,000 uh, picks placed. Uh, cuffed and tunneled central venous catheters have 1.6, so they are higher than pick. And then non-cuffed central venous catheters have non-medicated and tunneled are 1.7 and non-medicated and non-tunneled is 2.7. So this is our temporary dialysis catheter, which we place for one to two weeks for acute dialysis. And uh, and these are the tunnel dialysis catheter that we place and we are dialyzing out uh, in the center uh, patients for months sometime and sometime years. So 1.6 for them and 2.7 per 1,000 uh, catheters placed. So uh, one of the things that we we face is that when we are called uh, by the ICU team where the patients are admitted, the one that I just described, we usually see that there is a right IJ or a left IJ catheter placed. And so this is study is a great study which compared subclavian catheters IJ catheters and femoral catheters and infection rates in them. And uh, when you talk to the ICU colleagues or individuals who are placing the catheters, uh, uh, many uh, institutes, the catheters are placed by non-nephrologist at night sometime. And we see a lot of IJ catheters. And, and the reason that they present is that, oh, the femoral catheters are down below and their infection rates are very, very high. And this is study, uh, which is from 2012, and this is one of the earlier ones, but if you look at the later studies, most of them show there is no difference. And in this study, which is the largest one that I was able to find, it shows that about 16,370 catheters were placed, and there was no difference in catheter infection rate between femoral or IJ. There were two studies which were statistically outliers. If you remove those, there are no differences. Now, Depending on who is doing the study um, and what they are looking for, as we all know as researchers that if you want to find something, you end up finding that thing that you are looking for. And if you want the femoral catheters to be more infectious, then you will do some kind of a study that you will end up finding those things. But but in this study, again, as I said, it's one of the largest one. It does not show anything. So individuals who are septic, it would be nice to have a femoral dialysis catheter placed. And the reason would be that in, in individuals who are septic, whatever catheter that you're going to place, it's not going to last long. So if you put a femoral dialysis catheter, dialyze the patient through that one, twice, once, twice for one week, maybe for two weeks. And once the infection is over, you can remove the femoral catheter. Either they have recovered their kidney function, or if they have not recovered their kidney function, they can have a break of a day and then get a tunneled right IJ catheter. And the right IJ line is 
preserved so that it can be used for a tunneled catheter in the future. But if you put a temporary catheter in the upper IJ and then in the lower IJ, you are placing another temporary catheter. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, a tunneled catheter later on, or you're using the same uh, temporary dialysis catheter to rewire a tunneled catheter, then it will just cause more complications and problems, not only with the stenosis, but even the upper skin not healing, not coming together because the catheter was there for such a long time and the hole around it um, has granulized and it's just not healing. So any any uh, uh, discussion about femoral catheter being more, inf more infectious or causes more infection is just not true. I would say the reason individuals placed uh, right IJ catheters and not femoral is because probably they just it's it's mechanically more fun to do a right IJ catheter than compared to doing a femoral catheter. And again, we should not be thinking about fun. We should we should think what's the best thing for the patient. All right. So um, about subclavian venous stenosis, uh, this study shows that if there is subclavian venous stenosis, you could angioplasty it and angioplastying it will improve things. And later on, if there is a subclavian venous stenosis, you can angioplasty it and you can create even a fistula on that side. Um, so I included this that if a patient has subclavian venous stenosis, that should not be the reason that they should not get a fistula placed in that area. We could always angioplasty it and then try to create a fistula on the same side. Ideally, you do it on the other side, but if the other side is not available, like many of our patients, then you can certainly angioplasty it. So follow-up of the patient that we were talking about, the patient required uh, hemodialysis. His kidney function did not recover and he required multiple catheters secondary to the catheter infection. And then later on, he was discharged on hemodialysis through a right IG tunnel dialysis catheter which is usually the most common scenario that happens in our patients. Um, this uh, patient uh, did not recover um, and uh, he continued to require renal replacement. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, his, his kidney function did recover enough to not require renal replacement therapy and he required long term antibiotics and had a pick line placed on the arm for two weeks and then he was discharged home to follow up with primary uh, physician and his nephrologist. So ideally uh, femoral lines to start hemodialysis in patient with sepsis. If renal replacement therapy is stopped, then central veins are preserved for future access. If renal replacement therapies continue, then right IJ can be used for tunnel dialysis catheter placement when the sepsis is resolved and discussed. And if there is a need for longer term dialysis, then we can um, we have preserved the right IJ. Hopefully subclavian is preserved also, and therefore the chances of stenosis are going to be lower. So the learning point was that always plan for future access and think about which access to place in a patient with infection and uh, what are the accesses to avoid. And the answer is infectious patients pre place a femoral catheter so that you can later on remove it and preserve the IJ as we as as discussed and then try to avoid the right IJ. So I want to discuss what is the um, to try to make the venous system of the upper arm more simpler. And, uh, and this is usually a picture uh, uh, the, of the venous and the arterial system. But you know, for the vascular system, when I start thinking about the vascular system, this is my vascular system. It's very simple. There is the axillary artery, then the brachial artery, the radial artery on the thumb side, and the ulnar artery on the um, small finger side. This is my arterial system. And my venous system is also very simple that I think about, although it's much more complicated, but this is for a fistula placement. There is the cephalic vein, which runs from the uh, thumb all up to the shoulder. And then this is called the cephalic arch. Um, sometimes the fellows do not know what is a cephalic arch. People talk about the cephalic arch all the time, but this area is called the cephalic arch, where the cephalic vein goes into the uh, subclavian vein. And then there is this basilic vein in the forearm and the basilic vein in the upper arm, and then axillary vein, subclavian vein, superior vena cava, and the right heart here. 
I put a triangle here, a green triangle here, and the reason I put this here is this basilic vein in the upper arm is the largest vein available in the upper arm. And it is very important to know about this vein because when the patient gets admitted and they place an IV, they place an IV usually in the cephalic vein here or cephalic vein here. And one of the you know experienced nurses, you will see they will place um, IVs here uh, and here, but nobody plays an IV in the basilic vein. And the reason is the basilic vein here is too deep to place an IV. And here it is very close to the brachial artery. And because it is very close to the brachial artery, when you put your finger on the basilic vein, what you feel is the brachial artery pulse and everybody is scared of the artery. So nobody touches this vein. And this vein is usually available for us in the future to place a brachiobasilic fistula. This is a, a drawing of uh, the same thing that we discussed, cephalic vein cephalic vein and cephalic arch, basilic vein and large basilic vein in the upper arm, and then going into the superior vena cava and the right heart, and IJ comes here. Um, this is a combination of the two, uh, the, the artery and the veins, and on a regular human being, it looks like something like this. This person definitely had their coffee in the morning, so you can see the cephalic vein up here, large and big. The basilic vein here cannot be seen. These are superficial veins that, that are irrelevant when we talk about fistula placement. And, uh, uh, and this is the cephalic vein in the upper arm. Again, the basilic vein you cannot see. And I do not talk about these veins. And the reason I don't talk about these veins is, is they're irrelevant when it comes to fistula placement. But for um, um, uh, interventional new um, IR related fistula placement, these veins become more important. And you can see somebody placed an IV in the cephalic vein. So once you place IVs, the cephalic veins, you know, they destroy, they get destroyed, they get stenosed. This is the lower extremity, aorta, common iliac and femoral artery, and then the venous system is femoral vein, common iliac, and then goes into the inferior vena cava. All right, let's go with another question. Um, actually, before we go, yeah, actually, let's go with the next question. A 61-year-old gentleman who has been on dialysis for the last three years, and you have been called because there is a right IJ tunnel catheter, and it's not working well. Now, the nurse is requesting you to OK to TPA in it. What do you do? What do you do is you, you say OK, and um, if uh, the, the catheter doesn't work, then uh, and if the patient does not need acute dialysis, and this is for the fellows, you ask them to dwell it for 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, it doesn't work, and the patient is not such an urgent need for dialysis, you do it overnight or until the next hemodialysis. And the reason for that is so that they will not call you. The half-life of TPA is actually only five to 10 minutes. So if the TPA is not working within 30 minutes, likely it's not going to work the next day or after six hours or 12 hours or overnight, but it's okay to do it. And, and the reason it is okay to do it is, is patients when the catheters are not working is just not because of a clot. It could be many other reasons. And those many other reasons may go away overnight. And you or one may think that just leaving the TPA for a longer period of time worked, but actually it did not work. So there are two or three learning points here. The number one learning point is if it doesn't work in 30 minutes, it's not going to work. The clot is not going to dislodge itself after 30 minutes. The second learning point is that if after two hours, you have been called and the nurse tells you that I am unable to draw where I put 2.5 ml of TPA and I can push it, but I cannot draw it. It's OK to push it because 2.5 or 3 ml of TPA after two hours, that means it has completely it's not working at all. Then 
you can push it and nothing will happen to the patient. They're not going to bleed because of, of those three ml of TPA, which has been in the catheter for over 30 minutes or over, over one hour or overnight. So two learning points, don't leave it more than 30 minutes. If you are leaving it more than 30 minutes, don't expect anything come, to come out of it. It's not going to work after 30 minutes. Second thing, you can push it, push it inside the body after 30 minutes. It just doesn't matter because they're not going to bleed. Um, uh, in this, uh, there was, um, this is a great study. Um, this is a TPA for blood flow restoration in hemodialysis catheter. This was a multi-center randomized prospective study comparing dwell versus push. And it showed that uh, dwelling or pushing actually was kind of uh, the same. You could do either. Uh, you could argue that pushing was a little better. So this thing that leaving the uh, the TPA for uh, 30 minutes or two hours or overnight is going to do something better. It's actually may not be so true. And this is this study was done in, in Canada, so probably it's more reliable. All right. So the story continues. The catheter works for a short period of time and then it stops working again and you order a chest X-ray. And this is a chest X-ray. Uh, the chest X-ray shows that it's in the right atrium versus superior vena cava to right atrium. And the catheter was 23 centimeter long, and therefore you decided that you are going to change the catheter because likely either the patient has clots around the catheter or by looking at you, you decided this was a little too short of a catheter and therefore you wanted a little longer catheter. So what you decided was instead of a 23, the, the patient was sent and now they have a 28 centimeter catheter. And this is a chest X-ray after the catheter placement. Anybody can think what happened here? So it's the same location. Uh, if you look at it, the catheter before and after changing is exactly at the same location. And why is that? And the reason is, the question is that which catheter is longer? Is 23 longer or 28 longer? And the answer to that is actually they're the same. And the reason they're the same is when you look at the 23 and 28 numbers, the three is an uneven number all uneven numbers should be compared with uneven numbers. This is apple to orange uh, comparison because uneven cannot be compared with even. Even is when you are measuring the full catheter size and uneven, uh, odd numbers are when you are uh, measuring from the cuff to the tip. So at the end of the day, these both were the same catheters. And because they were the same catheters, there was no change um, in the in the catheter. Uh, then the next thing is always remember the cath when you send the patients to interventional radiology when they are doing their chest X-rays, they are doing uh, they are doing the procedure and they are doing a chest X-ray through the fluoroscopy uh, machine and. When they're doing that, the patient is laying flat uh, on the table and then they do it. And when the patient will sit up, the catheters will go up. So if you see a chest X-ray, which is completely okay and the location of the catheter is okay, get an upright film if you're having too much trouble. And it could be the catheter is shorter and you need a possibly a longer catheter, longer than what it was, to make sure when they are sitting up, it's still in the right location. Now, so, so the tip of the catheter rises with the upright position as discussed. This is laying down and this is standing up, uh, sitting up. And it kind of arises about like one, two centimeters, depending on the size of the patient, depending on where this arch is, and it can go significantly up. This, as you can see, this is an upper IJ, insertion site, if it would have been a lower IJ insertion site, maybe it would not have gone up so high. All right, now this is something very important to consider. When you place a catheter, and this is the catheter 
in the superior vena cava and right atrial junction, there are two holes in the catheter. One is the venous hole and the other one is the arterial hole. The arterial hole is higher than the venous hole. The venous hole is on the end and the arterial hole is above. And when you are doing dialysis, when we do dialysis, we are running this catheter at 350 ml per minute. And this 350 ml of blood drawing, blood sucking is coming out of this hole, the upper hole. And this upper hole is in the superior vena cava. And if you put this thing, the lower, uh, uh, the tip in the superior vena cava right atrial junction, this will go higher up. When it goes higher up, this area is small, especially in smaller people, in women, and basically smaller individuals, and you will not be able to suck all that blood through this hole. And therefore, if this catheter would have been here, then this hole would have been a little down. And here you would be able to suck all that blood. The second learning point is that when you uh, uh, when the nurse calls you and they say, oh, we switched lines. What does that mean? What they mean is instead of drawing the blood from here and pushing it here at the tip, they are drawing the blood here from the tip and then pushing it from the upper side. Now, the, it's easier to push from the upper side because even if there are walls around this area, you can still push blood, but you cannot suck it, but push it. But when you do that, this push, the blood comes here, the clean blood comes here, and then man, much of it is sucked back in, and then you are cleaning the clean blood, which is called recirculation. So when you when you uh, you know switch lines, the terminology that the nurses that are, the smart dialysis nurses are using is switching lines. You're causing some uh, recirculation, and in those recirculation situation, you just have to make sure that if the patient has severe hyperkalemia, you do check your potassium levels two to three hours after dialysis, just to make sure it, it is it is cleaned. And if they have severe uremia, uh, you know the BUN is actually getting cleaned. It's not like you're getting too much recirculation. From a practical perspective. There is no recirculation. There is recirculation, but it doesn't affect us much. And it's already doing the ultrafiltration portion of dialysis well. And cleaning part, it does enough that, you know, we are okay. So this should not be the reason for changing the catheter. If your URR and is good and you are correcting the potassium and phosphorus, then you are okay. All right. So th this publication has a lot of stuff related to uh, dialysis access and vascular access and pictures and a lot of uh, diagrams that I showed also. It's uh, free and it's available on the internet. Now, now, what is a graft? This is for the fellows. What is a graft is, this is my depiction of uh, the brachial artery and the radial and ulnar artery and the cephalic vein and the basilic vein. A graft is a piece of plastic. Basically, it used to be a cow's carotid. Now it's just a piece of uh, specialized, nice plastic, more and more expensive plastic. And, and if you consider this is the pipe. And what you do is wherever you place it, it basically is up to the surgeon to find an artery and an outflow vein. And you connect the graft so that you can place needles in the graft somewhere to do dialysis. Now, if you place it in the forearm, it becomes a forearm loop graft. If you place it in the upper arm from the brachial artery to this, this is brachioaxillary upper arm straight graft. If you, if you, if there are no veins or arteries there, you put it up here, then it is an upper arm axillary or axillary basilic or axillary axillary uh, loop graft, depending on whatever it is. So basically, again, grafts are, a connection, are connected to one artery where they get their blood flow and then one vein where they can um, throw their blood back, back to the central system and they can be accessed for dialysis. So they could be of so many different types depending on the surgeon, depending on what they found and what they decided to put in. Uh, another kind, you know, this patient did not have any cephalic vein, but had an upper cephalic vein, so a straight upper arm brachiocephalic straight graft. Very rare because then it drains into the cephalic vein and then cephalic arch, uh, uh, an area of common stenosis. The next is um, knowing what is a hero graft. Uh, a hero graft is half graft and half catheter. 
that means the indication to place a hero graft is usually that there is a central stenosis somewhere here, and therefore you place a catheter. And this catheter usually comes out in the chest here, but instead of coming out, you there is a graft here which you connect it to, and this graft is connected to the arterial anastomosis. So a hero graft is something which is a graft plus a catheter. What do we need to know about hero graft? And this is a hero graft connection with the brachial artery graft and then becomes a catheter which is in the ij and then in the heart the things to know about uh, hero graft is to make sure uh, uh, that the reason to place them is that the patient has a central problem and uh, they have a peripheral problem therefore they don't have peripheral veins and therefore they need a graft and when these graft clot you have 48 hours to declot them and it is an important thing if it is more than 48 hours then the patient would have to be likely be admitted and they would have to do tpa heparin because there's a larger amount of clot into um, the graft plus the catheter and and may cause more uh, pe and therefore will require some tpa and heparin. The lumen is six millimeter in size, so when they are angioplasting it, they use three to a uh, six to seven millimeter balloon throughout the graft as well as the the catheter. Now this is a leg, and a graft can be placed down below also in the femoral artery and then into the femoral vein or wherever, if common iliac or, and the femoral vein or, or wherever you can find an artery and a vein. And usually it goes like a loop and one can do dialysis through this. Should be always considered uh, before uh, thinking and saying that this patient cannot get any uh, fistula or graft placement. Dialysis alarms, very important. There are only two kinds of dialysis alarms, venous alarms and arterial alarms. Um, High pressure alarms are venous alarms, low pressure alarms are arterial alarms. Um, uh, whenever you are being called and somebody is telling you that there is an alarm, just ask them what kind it is. And it, would, it should be one of those. And what it means is the arterial alarm is when you're trying to remove the blood, you are sucking and drawing the blood, but because there is an stenosis somewhere here, you are unable to draw, and therefore there is negative pressure, negative pressure, which will cause an arterial alarm. And venous alarm is when you are trying to push the uh, blood flow, and the blood flow is moving forward, but there is a stenosis in the outflow, and therefore it is backing up, and there is high pressure in the graft or the fistula. It's called high pressure alarm or venous alarm. The low pressure alarms, arterial alarms, could be because of many reasons. Could be art from an uh, uh, AV fistula or a graft perspective, it could be stenosis. But hemo from a hemodynamic perspective, it could be hypotension, dehydration, poor heart function. Um, it could be anything which is making you or your machine not to able to remove 350 ml or 250 ml of blood draw in 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 one minute and the high pressure alarm or anything that is making your blood not go through and reach the heart so it could be anything between your needle to the heart it could be a needle placement issue to a stenosis in a catheter as i said previously it could it could be you know, because it's higher, you are unable to suck the blood up here, and 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 we talked about reversal of the lines. And what you do for uh, management is, if it's a catheter, you can TPA it. You can make sure that the volume status of the patient is okay. Many times the patient would be dehydrated. You give them a liter, and the catheter will start working because now there is some blood or or fluid in the right atrium versus the superior vena cava, and now you can draw something. And uh, get a chest X-ray if uh, the catheter exchange is needed. Make sure it's done with an angiogram. This is a fibrin sheet. You know. Uh, like a sock around uh, the catheter. And then once you angioplasty it, you basically break the, the sheath and it go goes to the lungs, which are not important. The kidneys are the most important organ. So if the lung gets some clot, nothing happens to the patient. They get some deep, uh, heparin and they're usually okay. Not usually, always almost okay. And then you can see the blood flow and you can put the catheter back. If it's a fistula, you can do clinical management of volume and pressure. 
you have to examine. You have to do an ultrasound chair side and you can do a fistulogram to assess what's going on. You cannot examine a fistula while on dialysis. So if you get a call from someone who is doing your procedures and they say, did you examine the fistula? You can tell them, I do not examine a fistula on dialysis and the patient was or is on dialysis when we see them. So we cannot examine the fistula because when you examine, you have to press it. If you press it, it will burst. It will, you know, it will start bleeding and you cannot do that. So you'll have to do it like a couple of hours after uh, the dialysis is over to do an, uh, an actual examination. But you can certainly do an ultrasound. Uh, something about pseudoaneurysm. These are pseudoaneurysms. Um, it's, these are very stable. As you can see, skin is very stable there. Um, and it's it's good. Make sure that there is no outflow stenosis because if there is outflow stenosis, there is high pressure. And because of the high pressure, there is ballooning of the fistula or the graft. Document the size of the aneurysm, monitor the size, monitor the increase in flows, and monitor the skin overlying the aneurysm. If it's shiny, it's dangerous. This is called a shiny skin. If it's shiny, this needs immediate surgical attention, urgent uh, surgical attention, because this can burst. Um, what is a uh, aneurysm um, in a graft versus fistula? You need to know if it is actually an aneurysm or is it is a dilatation. First of all, make sure there is no outflow stenosis causing the dilatation of the fistula versus true aneurysm. Um, and then make sure that the needle site is not the shiny place. It should be away from the shiny place. And then you can examine and see how th things are. This is actually an aneurysm. It is pedunculated and um, and and this is how it's looking like. And uh, this is actually dilatation uh, because of the needles. And what you can do is you can put a stent in there and you actually do not have to do surgery in this graft and it would be just OK. Uh, so what type of catheters are we using? We use different kinds of catheters. Um, I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move a little faster. Um, just make sure that temporary IJ catheters, the Mohurkar catheters are exactly the same. The palindromes, uh, ash split, tunnel catheters, they are kind of the same. The tunneled pick and the central tunnel catheters are the same. The tunneled pick means it's actually not a P. You cannot have a P and a C in the same um, uh, sentence. P means peripheral and C means central. So how can you have a central uh, peripheral catheter? It's like drinking chai tea. You know, how can you have chai tea? You can either have chai or you can have tea. You cannot have a peripherally insert central pick line. You cannot have it. But many times uh, this term is used for a central catheter, which is used um, to put it centrally, but it's actually a pick catheter. So, but it's not actually a pick. It's a, a regular catheter, which is placed centrally. And then there are pick lines. Pick lines. Many reasons of getting a consult is we uh, there is a patient and he needs a pick or he or she needs a pick line and can we place a pick line? So as we discussed subclavian, this uh, um, basilic vein is one of the largest vein of the patient, you know, the upper arm. And if you place a pick line, pick line goes from here uh, into the basilic vein and then goes up to the central venous system. If midlines are up to here, uh, they end sub where in the subclavian um, vein. And when you place a, a pick line, what happens is it passing through the basilic vein and any cannulation of the basilic vein will cause the basilic vein uh, to develop a stenosis in the future. And then if you have placed a pick line just once, even for two days or one day, that basilic vein can never be used for fistula placement and you have lost that arm. Uh, there are studies done to angioplasty it and use it not very successful, not successful. So do not get pick line placed in patients. Instead, ask them to place a central tunneled catheter, which is just like a dialysis tunnel catheter, except it's um, it's thinner. It's uh, the bore is uh, thinner. How to find what catheter it is, you know, just look at the insertion site and location. I'm not going to go into this a little. Um, this is important when to ligate the fistula. Uh, there are a couple of reasons to uh, ligate a fistula. If a patient has ischemic monomalic neuropathy, rare disease, but they have severe pain, that is an indication to dilate, uh, to ligate the fistula. And then a steel syndrome. A steel syndrome usually doesn't happen if the AV fistula is in the snuff box. If it is in the 
radiocephalic 0.3% chances, brachiocephalic 0.9% and brachiobasilic 3.7% chances of developing a steel syndrome. Why? Because basilic vein is big and you are diverting too much blood from the brachial artery into the uh, basilic vein. Uh, this is um, about um, uh, a response that we see if we occlude the fistula. And when we occlude the fistula, what we see is um, uh, the pulse goes down uh, because the thought is that uh, the heart is pumping um, for the fistula. And when the fistula is removed from the flow, so you occlude the fistula, the heart does not have to pump that much. And you can immediately see if they are going to have a good flow. Mm. Okay, so if you see a patient with heart failure, check if it is a high output failure or low cardiac output failure. If it's low output failure, it doesn't pertain to us. If it's physiological, it doesn't pertain to us. If it's pathological and it's related to RTA venous fistula, then it does pertain to us. And we need to make sure that not everyone is a candidate for a fistula placement. Our old patients who have heart failure, they will never be candidates for fistula placement because when you place a fistula, you cause in decrease in peripheral resistance, increase in cardiac output, decrease um, in uh, increase in blood volume, return and it causes RV dilatation, a reduced ejection fraction and heart failure. And this we with the fistula first initiative, we just talk about uh, fistulas, 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 and we should not be thinking about fistulas in everyone. Not everyone should have a fistula. And if the patient has high card, imagine a patient with an ejection fraction of let's say three liters and their access flow is two liters. The heart is pumping three liters of blood and two liters is going through the axis. There is only one liter for the body to uh, to use for uh, for oxygenation and that will cause the heart to pump more and they will develop heart failure. Uh, there are studies done in which they have uh, ligated fistulas uh, post uh, transplant and it does improve overall uh, the heart function of the heart. Uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much. Please, uh, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Qureshi, for that very clinical and practical overview. Uh, it, so, it, you know, some of those things are are very uh, pertinent to us. We we are a very um, line heavy program. We have like I don't know, 50, 60 percent lines, and not fistula in our outpatient. Uh, and we are also lucky to have um, vascular access coordinators. Um, so we have uh, vascular access coordinators, some of whom are in the audience who actually, you know, take care of. If we have a problem with access, we just call them and they take care of what needs to be done. And they are way more experienced than, you know, most of our uh, trainees and even staff nephrologists are. Uh, so if people have a questions, please raise your hand and ask them. I, I'll start uh, with, uh, you didn't talk about POCUS. I have heard that you are a big POCUS enthusiast. Uh, is, is How would you say we should incorporate, and we don't do enough POCUS. Uh, I think, you know, I'm I'm still learning. We use it somewhat in the clinic. How would you think POCUS could be in, incorporated for vascular access? So in the dialysis unit, POCUS can be used for the nurses. Actually, in our dialysis unit in Mayo Clinic, we have uh, POCUS in every dialysis unit. And the dialysis uh, nurses can use POCUS to see if the fistula is deep or not and where to uh, cannulate the fistula. From a... Uh, from a perspective of the fellows, I think POCUS is good. It is another tool that you can use, increases patient satisfaction. You can immediately know if it is there is hydronephrosis or not. Um, I have another talk um, where you know we, we can talk about what to see in POCUS, and it's very simple to assess the kidney size and the echogenicity of the kidneys and hydronephrosis. So it can be used for that, but it's just another tool. You know, uh, there is a lot of focus on POCUS regarding volume assessment also, which in our patient population in, in, in North America, it is very hard because our patients have valvular disease, heart failures, and in those patients just doing POCUS or seeing uh, B lines is not going to tell us if the volume status is low or high. I would say it's just an additional thing. It is not one of those things that you can just do and make a final diagnosis. 
it could be an additional thing to the to the already clinical assessment that you are one is doing but if you are rounding on the icu and somebody says oh the uh, it's dilated so remove the fluid uh, that's just not true. You will have to assess what is the valvular status of the heart, what is the uh, CVP, what is the, if there are cardiac catheterization findings, and then go with the clinical picture ex rather just than POCUS. It is important to have POCUS in the program so that the fellows can start seeing those pictures and get used to those pictures so that when they see it in the future, uh, when the technology becomes cheaper and cheaper and ultrasound is available in every, every corner, then uh, they should be able to understand what it is. But again, I would just call it a tool. Uh, it, it, people got really too excited with that. And now that it is getting cheaper, the, the commercial dial dialysis centers are also putting focus in the dialysis units. But that's the extent that I think it would be helpful. Yeah, I, I think for needling, especially for nurses, that's that's a useful uh, tool for sure, and and many other places. Um, going back to your first case, where uh, you know you sh you what you described is what happens at our center, right? It's mostly the ICU uh, first year resident who will put a IJ line at night, uh, and we'll start uh, dialysis. Um, you kind of suggested that maybe a femoral might perhaps be superior in that sort of a situation because. Uh, uh, of, uh, you know, repeated IJ or, or possible infections and stuff. Could you expand on that? Is that something that you have pushed for locally? Because we haven't done. And, and if we start doing that, that would be a practice change. Absolutely. I think um, the in the reason that we do IJs is just because of convenient and it is more fun to go in the neck and it is just not fun to go in the groin. It's not clean. We have to pull the panis. Somebody has to hold it. It's just not fun. And therefore, people don't go down there. But um, again, as I said, the infection rates are exactly the same. And especially if you are going to keep the line for one week because the patient is already septic, you have to replace the line. Then you have to save the, it is logical to save the space that you are going to use this for long term. And long term meanings not only tunnel dialysis catheter, but also fistula placement in the future. So you should use, one should always use ephemeral. It is a practice change. It's a hard work because as you said, this is exactly what happens with us also. Somewhere in the night, there is a catheter is, is already placed and then somebody is asking for a catheter uh, for a dialysis. And in these individuals, they they have so many lines placed and which cause problems. And then another question is that if you place a central line versus a temporary dialysis catheters, those are two different things. Central line is much thinner. The chances of developing a stenosis with a central line is lesser compared to to a temporary dialysis catheter, which is much thicker and which is going to rub on the vein more and causes more stenosis. Absolutely, to the practice change, it needs to be done. Uh, so to follow up on that, any any comments about um, A, that if it's a large panis, uh, you may also have an angulation, right? Because it goes in deep and then it turns up, um, you know, because there may be a lot of fat in the, in the thigh that you're going through to get into the vein. Uh, so does the same, you know, the the what you showed wonderfully with the left uh, with the left IJ, do the same considerations apply with the with the femoral uh, in those circumstances? And do you want to comment on, you know, what's the right length when you're putting in a femoral line? For the femoral length, the longest catheter that you have available is the best length. So 28 centimeter or 32 centimeter, 28 is the best, the longer the better. The second thing is if you have POCUS and all of uh, our uh, dialysis catheters are done by uh, ultrasound. So you can come into the thigh rather than like we used to do in the past, going blind, uh, palpating the pulse and going into the groin. So instead of growing, you're going into the thigh and the turn is not as much compared to the IJ. So the femoral turns are much lesser compared to the left IJ. They are comparable to the right IJ. So uh, just use a long catheter and can go as, as high as possible. And Ideally into the inferior vena cava. Right, right, exactly. Um, we, we don't know enough of femoral lines. I mean, it used to be that we'd, we would do femoral lines all the time, uh, and now it's hardly uh, uh, <laughs> done, uh, which is, you know, I thought that was a welcome change, but maybe not. Um, yeah, and Dr. Zimmerman is asking in the in the chat is uh, are there are flow issues more common for femoral compared to IJ in in your experience? 
So in the beginning, when the patients are intubated, sedated, and laying straight on the bed, there are no issues. Once they start waking up and they start sitting up, then you start having some problems with the flows issue. And by that time that they are extubated, they're doing better, their infections are usually resolved, or they're still on antibiotics, but the issue related to bacteremia is resolved. And at that time, you can remove the femoral catheter and go with the tunnel dialysis catheter. Fantastic. Um, Dr. Akbari. Uh, you're, you're muted, Ayub. Thank you, Fawad, for an excellent talk. Uh, would you comment on lines being placed when there is a fistula when we are doing CRRT? And at your center, do you do SLED? And if you do it, do you do it with a fistula or do you do it with a line? OK, so let me answer the second question because it's simpler and easier. What we do is for a SLED or um, a CRRT for, for anything related to that new machine, the slow machine, we uh, have to get a catheter placed. And not only that, we have to place two catheters because the other one is a central line for calcium and uh, we are giving citrate for uh, uh, regional uh, anticoagulation to all of our patients, even liver failure patients also. So we use two catheters. So that's one thing. We never use a fistula for SLED or CRRT. Um, the second question is, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the first question actually. So oh, when we place these lines, do you place it in IJ Correct. or do you go Correct. to the uh, femoral because they already have a fistula? Absolutely. When in, in those situations, not we, uh, the patient is usually in the ICU or cardiothoracic units. Uh, we have a lot of heart transplants and other organ transplant. They end up getting a central catheter, which is usually an IJ, left or right IJ. And... Uh, and, and their fistulas get many times destroyed, basically. Because as we know, if we know the highway, uh, if you're putting in an IJ, then the flow is going to be diminished or blocked, and you will have a higher chance of losing those fistulas. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and it's kind of unfortunate, right? It's, it's partly, I think it's nursing and experience with fistula. Uh, though, of course, using a fistula is, is not easy. Uh, but if we could use it, uh, you know, safely, uh, that would avoid all that plastic in our in our sick people. Um, uh, oh, the the femoral lines is still uh, a subject of discussion. So Janet Graham is asking. So she she used to be our vascular access coordinator when we started the program. She's now the director of our program. She's asking about the higher rates of recirculation uh, with femoral lines. You know, do you have any comments on that? You know, again, uh if you're using a long line, it's less likely to happen, but. Is that a concern, uh, especially when you are reversing? Um, so, you know, uh, technically you would think that would be the case, but we have been reversing lines for years and decades. How many times any one of us even thought about recirculation or not getting a good dialysis from a patient? And that's... Uh, physiologically, it is happening, but is it affecting clinically? It does not. Even in the upper um, catheters, it doesn't, and in the lower catheters, definitely it doesn't. So you can definitely reverse line, do whatever needs to be done uh, in that short period of time, and it should be okay. Yeah. yeah, exactly. As you said, it's a short period of time, and the longer the lines, the better it is. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Before you finish, I do have to tell a joke. Oh, sure. and, and 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 this this is a nephrology joke, and unfortunately, it's a true joke. So one of my friend calls me from somewhere, and he tells me that uh, uh, there is a patient uh, with uh, with a fistula, uh, which is working well, and this patient has heart failure, and uh, has an LVAD. So. So it is so interesting. We have gotten, we push for a fistula so much. And I, and I tell this joke because, you know, you have a lot of catheters and everybody pushes to get a fistula placed and fistula may not always be a good answer. So in this joke, which is unfortunately a true joke, this patient ended up getting a fistula in an LVAD. That means the patient had severe heart failure, and in heart failure, you should never place a fistula because the fistula is diverting the flow and causing more ischemia to the rest of the body. But the joke starts here, that the fistula is working. So not. So the question is, was the fistula placed wrong or the LVAD placed wrong? 
<laughs> what was <laughs> what was a mistake so i think we should just not focus on on fistulas as much we might be doing a lot of uh, catheter placement especially big centers like yours and ours because other smaller centers don't deal with the heart failure patients that we have to deal with and we have to continue to focus on our patients and look at what is their heart uh, function like and if they can be candidates for fistula placement otherwise continue with catheters otherwise there would be other uh, complications and you know how this is CMS and other uh, authorities are. They just start thinking of one thing and they push the doctors and the providers to do certain things which may not be good for the patient. Absolutely right. Uh, yeah, we, we also have metrics. Hey, Ayub, you are muted. We have ORN here, Ontario Renal Network, which pushes us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're nicer than CMS from what I know, but yes, we also have our different set of metrics. Um, but uh, on that note, uh, thank you again for presenting to us. This was a wonderful uh, clinical uh, talk uh, and, and I hope we can uh, meet sometime in person. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.